welcome back. Uh, if you haven't checked in, do that in the next 10 seconds. Um, is everyone okay checking in? Yeah? All right, good. All right, I'm turning it off now, and I'm going to start the class with a question, a multiple choice question. The question is this, and what I'm going to try to do every class, I'll see if this works. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I'll stop, but I think I'm going to try this is to start every class with a question that will um, jog your memory from last class and bridge your memory to this class. Because I find invariably, whenever I ask, does anyone have any questions from last week? No one ever has any questions. I forgot what was last week, it was four days ago. So this will force you to think about it. So the question is, multiple choice question, which enumerated powers in Article One, Section 8 did Chief Justice Marsh rely on in McCulloch v. Maryland to uphold the constitutionality of the Bank of the United States? Choice A is the Commerce Clause. Choice B is the Taxing Power. Choice C is the Necessary and Proper Clause. And Choice D is all the above. I'll give you another 30 seconds. Again, these are not graded. This is simply for your own uh, your own recall and to help you understand what we're doing today. Okay. Thirty votes or ten seconds or so. And by the way, I know when you don't vote, and if I find people not voting consistently, I'm going to talk to you. So this is for your own benefit. Put in an answer. Uh, lock yourself in and make the class more enjoyable. Yeah, I checked last night. A lot of people didn't vote. <laughs> I know. It's a great vote. I mean, I'm not creating it, but I want people to do this. It's part of your participation. <laughs> All right. Only 35 of you voted, 36. Now, the other thing is, I don't want to show you the results right away. Because I find when I show you the results, people start being hesitant to give their answer. And I learned, I didn't know this, so a student told me, is the second I hit the stop button, um, it shows you the results, right? So I'm not going to do that. Instead, I want to call on people and ask what they put and uh, what their answers were and explain why. That's how I'm going to try and run this. So if it works, if it doesn't, I'll stop it. All right, where did I finish up last week? Who was the last student? Always pointing at you. Are you last? Uh, are you next? Liz. Liz. Okay, Zach, are you next, I guess? Yeah. All right. Zach, what did you put, A, B, C, or D? I uh, put C. Okay, why did you put C? Um, because they had the, uh, I can't remember exactly what they had, but it was necessary and proper to build the bank to like finance the war and everything like that. So they didn't have the enumerated power to make the bank, but it was necessary to carry out the power. Okay. Uh, is that Anthony? I took C. Okay, why'd you pick C? Because, um, I mean, a lot of the same reasons, Zach, but just because I think it's necessary and proper to, uh, they could create the bank and that the states could tax the federal bank. They could. Did anyone put something else? Yeah. Um, D. Okay. How many people put D? Okay. I want to show the results now. Okay, let's see the breakdown. I'm guessing it's mostly C and D, if I had to guess. Okay. So about 60% of you put C and about 35% of you put D. All right. Why did you put D? Well, I put D because they relied on the necessary and proper clause in order to execute, I don't know if execute the right word, their taxing power. And then it said that, like, the importance of taxation to regulate an area, and then it, then it also regarded to commerce and the fact that taxation also was related to it. So I feel like they used a bit of everything. Okay, good. Who else put D one raise your hand? Uh, yeah, Mark. Um, I looked at it and I remember that the necessary and cost or proper clause can only be used to expand like the enumerated things before. So we can't have the necessary and cost or proper clause by itself. I know for sure it was used, so it had to be. Okay, anyone else want to put? Any hands? C or D? Uh, uh, yeah, Brittany. I was going to put back what Martin said. I thought the opposite. I thought only C because it's like an umbrella. Under the necessary and proper clause, all of those powers were already given to them, necessary and proper is to expand it. So 
You don't really need all of the above if necessary and proper covers okay. all that. Good. I think one more. Amber, is your hand up? Well, I was going to say similar. I, I thought, yes, they talk about taxing power and commerce yeah. clause, but you rely primarily on the necessary and proper clause. You didn't yeah. rely on the commerce clause. All right. The answer is C. The answer is just <laughs> necessary and proper. Not all the above. And I, I framed it this way deliberately because the court talked about commerce, right? They talked about tax and power. But what we have here is the application of how the necessary and proper clause operates. Okay? The necessary and proper clause is an independent power, right? It goes above and beyond what is enumerated. It goes above and beyond what's enumerated in Article 1, Section 8. The commerce power by itself didn't get you far enough to charter a bank. The taxing power by itself did not get you far enough to charter a bank. However, in order to have a national bank, right, it was necessary and proper. In order to regulate commerce on a national scale, it was necessary and proper to have a bank. In order to have currency, where there be taxation in all 13 states, or however many states there were at the time, it's both necessary and proper. Right? A necessary and proper way of regulating commerce will include the power to charter a bank. The power to charter a bank is separate. It's its standalone power. Indeed, what Chief Justice Marshall said is, as long as the means chosen that is a bank, is convenient way to regulate commerce, that is valid, as long as it's conducive, as long as it's helpful to the government. And so long as it's not some sort of great independent power, it's fine. We'll see later on in the Obamacare litigation, we'll say that in about a couple weeks, can Congress make you buy health insurance? Can they have a mandate to buy health insurance? And the court said no. Even though making people buy insurance is a necessary way of ensuring people pay their fair share. It is not proper because it's intruding. It's this great substantive power to make someone buy something. It's an independent power. So the limits here, in McCullough weren't even close. But we'll see in the Obamacare litigation, they went too far. Everyone, everyone understand that question, right? Everyone get necessary and proper as a standalone power that goes above and beyond what's in Article 1, Section 8. Questions on that one? Okay, good. Now, 35 of you voted. I know there were 35 of you here. So, all right. So today, we're going to be moving on from the Marshall Court and focusing on three periods in time. Now, this class will not be taught purely chronologically, but in certain respects, it will. The reason why I've decided to teach the class in this fashion is it gives you a progression, or an arc, if you will, of how constitutional law evolved. The Marshall Court was very much in favor of a strong central federal government. And in McCullough, it read the Necessary Proper Clause in a very specific fashion, broad. What you're going to see here by the Chase Courts and progressive courts is something a little bit different. The court begins to scale back on the scope of federal power and reads it a little bit more narrowly. And what you have to ask yourselves as you read McCullough last week, this week you read Craig, you read DeWitt, Griswold, E.C. Knight, is the court reading the Constitution in a similar fashion? Or are they moving around? And especially when we get to the legal tender cases, Right? Within a couple of years, they reverse themselves. The Supreme Court's doctrine is not a straight line. It's a kind of a sine wave, if you will, arcs that go through time. And one of the challenges in this class will be figuring out where we are in time. And the way that I test this, and now people start paying attention, uh, but the way that I test this is you have two exam questions right in the final. One exam question will say the year is 2017. Give us the answer to current doctrine. The second question, and sometimes I do have order, but the, the other question is, the year is 1840. The year is 1868, right? How does this case shake out? And then you have to know, oh, 
a commercial outline won't help you because they won't tell you what the doctrine was at a given point in time. You have to know how the law developed over the last two centuries, which is why chronology matters. I want you to know how we got there, not just where we are. Understand? Now, the cases today involving Prig, uh, 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 Prig, DeWitt, Griswold, they involve seemingly like totally unrelated things, right? Prig involves a Fugitive Slave Act. DeWitt involves a tax on oil, right? Hepburn involves money, paper money, which most of you never, never even thought does any other type of money, right? Paper money. And the last case involves monopoly. But all these cases share a common thread. And that thread is what are the scope of Congress's enumerated powers, right? What can Congress do? Right, any questions on this? Okay. All right, Case, you're up. What are the facts in Prig for Pennsylvania, please? Um, well, Margaret Morgan left Maryland uh, to marry a free black man in Pennsylvania. Um, she <coughs> went up there, she had children with him, and then um, Prig came up there. And Who is Prig? He, I guess he was a, an agent of the... Oh, uh, you're, you're charitable. What, what, what was his job title? It wasn't just an agent. He had a very specific job title. How would you describe his profession? He was a slave catcher. A slave catcher, yeah, yeah, right? So here's what happened, right? Margaret Morgan was a slave in Maryland. Her uh, uh, master let her go north to Pennsylvania, which was a free state. She married there, had some kids, and she was living on her own, free. Then her owner passed away. And the daughter came to the picture. And as I'm sure you learned in property, when a father dies, the property descends. So she was probably the heir of, the, of Margaret, under her understanding. She sent a slave catcher up to Pennsylvania to recover Margaret and her kids, by the way. Right? Don't, don't forget that. <laughs> under the law in effect, a child born to a slave was, it, was the property of the, of the slave owner. That, that's, how, that's how the slave trade worked, right? The children born thereof were actually property as well. So you had this situation where these people called slave catchers, and these were awful people. Um, very often, such as this case, there was a dispute about whether the person was slave or not. Um, the fact of the matter is slave catchers would simply go up to a random person, say, do you have any papers with you? No. Okay, you're, you're, you're captured slave, bring them down south. Never hear from them again. Did anyone see that movie, 12 Years a Slave? Yeah, watch that movie if you, if you had it. It's a, it's a hard movie to watch, but there's a scene where you have this guy who's a musician, right? Uh, and he's asked to play a show. Is it in D.C. or Maryland? I can't remember. I think in D.C., right? Anyway, you have these guys luring him down south, saying, oh, we have a show. You can play a musician, whatever. And they just sold him down south. This was really common. Uh, so this case, there was actually a legal dispute about her, her, her status of emancipation, but often there wasn't. Aha, but Mr. Prig picked the wrong state to act as a slave catcher, right? Carla, what happened when Prig tried to arrest and, and bring back South Margaret and her family? Well, he got Margaret and her family back to uh, the, the woman that hired him, uh -huh. but he himself then was uh, indicted. And, and, uh, indicted on, on offense of what law? Kidnapping. Kidnapping. Now, was this a federal law or a state law he was violated? State law. So Pennsylvania had a law that prohibited, well, specifically, what did the law prohibit? What did the Pennsylvania law prohibit there? Oh, uh, so, so they prohibited uh, him to do what he did, uh, recapture, yes, exactly. uh, without working the proper channels of going through yes. the state. Okay, very good. So to understand, uh, you've probably heard of the Mason-Dixon line, have you heard of this? This is a line that separates Pennsylvania from Maryland. And uh, Maryland was a slave state. Pennsylvania was a free state. In fact, this is funny. If you ever drive north, and I've done this many times, when you enter Pennsylvania, right, there's a sign that says you're now crossing the Mason-Dixon land. Like, in other words, welcome to freedom. When you're going south, they don't have a sign about that. Right? There's no... I actually once pulled over and took a picture of this. It's probably dangerous. But um, uh, when you're driving north, it's like, welcome... 
Welcome to Pennsylvania. You're driving south. They didn't even, didn't even know the base of Nixon line, whatever, right? Um, so Pennsylvania was a free state, a very, very big abolitionist state. And they passed a law saying that if you're a slave catcher, right, and then you come here and you try and bring back a slave outside of our borders, you're violating our state law. You need to work, I think Carla put it through the channels, right? You need to go to a court, you get a license, right? Now, Carla, finish it up. Do you think any Pennsylvania state judges are going to give out these licenses? Of course not, right? And that's what happened here. The Pennsylvania judge said, screw off. I'm not giving you a damn thing. This woman's a free person. Let her stay here with her family, right? Okay, fine. Uh, he was convicted of violating this offense. His conviction was affirmed by the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, and it goes to the U.S. Supreme Court. Okay, Kevin, what is Prigg's defense before the U.S. Supreme Court? That the Constitution gave him the right to go seize his property and to the Supreme Court. Okay, is it just the Constitution, or what exactly did Prigg rely on? Let's be precise here. You're, you're really close. Was it only the Constitution we're talking about here, or was it something else? Well, it was with the Articles as well. Okay, well, the Articles of the Constitution, but what else are we talking about here? Not just the Constitution, we've got something else in store. Really close. David? Bingo. What is the Fugitive Slave Act? You're exactly right. What is a Fugitive Slave Act? Um, person charged in any state of treason, felony, or other crime who shall be taken justice and be found in another state shall on demand of the executive authority of the state from which he fled be delivered up. Now, are you reading the Fugitive Slave Act or are you reading from the Constitution? What are you reading from? You're reading something correct, but are you reading from the Constitution or the Fugitive Slave Act? It's from the second section. Okay, is that the Fugitive Slave Act? Yeah, you're right. So let, let's let's take this out of turn, okay? So we have here Article 4, Section 2 of the Constitution. This is what's known as the Fugitive Slave Clause. So don't confuse. The Fugitive Slave Act, which is something passed by Congress, and the Fugitive Slave Clause, which is in the Constitution itself. Just don't get, don't, don't, don't get them twisted. Um, David read it. I'll read it again. Article 4, Section 2 says, a person charged in any state with treason, felony, or other crime who shall flee from justice and be found in another state shall on demand of the executive authority of that state be delivered up to be removed from the state. Now, there's nothing in that provision that specifically refers to slavery, although it probably does. This is about if you have a runaway fugitive from state A to state B, the governor of state B has responsibility to return. Now, also Article 4, Section 2. It says, no person held to service or labor. That is a code word for slave. Remember, the Constitution doesn't use the word slavery. It uses these um, the euphemisms, right? The person bound in slavery, person bound in labor, something like that. No person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof, that is, Miss Margaret was a lawfully owned slave in Maryland, under the laws thereof, escaping into another, and from the perspective of the daughter, she escaped up to Pennsylvania, shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein, in other words, it doesn't matter what laws Pennsylvania enacts, right? It doesn't matter what laws Pennsylvania enacts. Be discharged from service or, service or labor, but shall be delivered up on the claim of the party to, her, to whom such service or labor may be due. Um, what does that mean? If a person from Maryland, a slave, runs up to Pennsylvania, escapes, no Pennsylvania law can free her. Right? Nothing, Pennsylvania can't pass a law saying any slave who gets here becomes free. And any law that prevents the return of that slave is irrelevant. And the party, right? Here, here, Prig was the agent. Prig was representing Miss, uh, the, 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 the master. Must be delivered. Okay. So, uh, uh, you got a name tag there? Uh, what you get, get later. What's your name? Adam. Adam. So, generally, what do we know when you have a state law that seems in tension with the federal constitution, what 
what happens in such situations? Usually the federal law wins. Usually? Yeah, the federal law wins. Always. Why does the federal law trump, or so why does the federal constitution trump the state law? Yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta give me an answer. You gotta give me text here. I need text. What part of the Constitution establishes the principle that a federal law, I'm sorry, the federal Constitution that conflicts with the state law, the federal law prevails? You said it right. Give me a provision of the Constitution. Someone said it a few minutes ago. Kevin? You said it a few minutes ago. Yeah, you. Supremacy clause, right? Adam, what's the supremacy clause? Makes what the Supreme Law of the Land? The Federal Constitution? Yes. Article 6, right? Supremacy Clause. Says the Supreme Court, I'm sorry, the Constitution, there's nothing about the Supreme Court. Right. The, the, the Constitution is the Supreme Law of the Land, and any state law to the contrary is null and void. So here we have a situation, right, where Pennsylvania passed a law that at least seems in conflict with. Article 4 of the Constitution. Right. So Prig says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I was convicted under this law, this, this, future, uh, this Pennsylvania law, that's in conflict with the U.S. Constitution. So Brandon, what, what's the consequence of that conflict? Uh, he was right. Well, well, the court said he was right. Why did the court say he was right? <laughs> Because the, the state law was unconstitutional. Well, you, well, look, Brandon, read for me again Article 4, Section 2. Re read this paragraph one more time. How about? Yeah, but if you read to yourself, that's not very helpful. So read it out loud to your classmates and benefit. No person held to service or labor in one state, under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall, in consequence of any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service or labor which shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. Okay, now let's pause for a second, all right? Brandon, is there any conflict between Pennsylvania's law and this provision? Is there, an, is there an actual conflict? And I'll ask this question a little more precisely. Did the Pennsylvania law purport to emancipate Margaret and make her a free person? No, I guess to Carlo's point, it just set up channels. Yeah, channels. And are the creation of those channels, Brandon, in conflict with this clause? Amber, you're nodding. What do you think? Yes. Okay, tell me why. Well, based off of the article itself, it says that they have to deliver up. Who's that? Who's that? The states. Ah, oh, the state, up. right? Yes. But what is this law actually doing? It's just stating that, um, I guess it gives right to the slave owner to claim them whenever they need to. That's pretty loose. Uh, Amber, can the, can the federal government, can the Constitution require states to do stuff? Yes. Uh, David, let me ask you this question. Is throwing Mr. Prig in jail in any way in conflict with this? They delivered up this Margaret, right? Margaret was, was back in Maryland. Is throwing Prig in jail in conflict with this? Yes, it is. How so? Oh, yeah, but that's him so this is a debate. You see what I'm getting at, right? It's not 100% in conflict, but if we take this language seriously and Pennsylvania starts throwing in jail any slave catchers, that provision comes very hard to enforce. So the majority opinion by Justice Story basically says, um, look, if we read this shall be delivered language, right? If we read it so narrowly that it only means literally you deliver the body, that this provision is worthless. And Story goes on to explain that this was an essential provision of the Constitution to get it ratified. Why was this so essential to get it ratified? Because the southern states were afraid that Pennsylvania would pass a law saying, okay, anyone who comes here is free and we'll protect you. Pennsylvania would have done in a heartbeat. Basically, you'd be eliminate slavery immediately because you'd have underground railroad people going up north. 
So this provision was added to the Constitution. And what Justice Story says is, we have to read this basically in a practical way to prevent the northern states from doing exactly what Pennsylvania tried doing, throwing in jail the slave catchers. So even though this case concerns um, uh, uh, slavery, it was at bottom, what are the powers of Congress and how are courts to read it? And here a story, like Marshall did in McCullough, reads federal power very broadly. And you know, you could all care less about the National Bank, right? But here it actually makes a difference. Had the case come out differently, had the case been that, no, 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 Pennsylvania can throw in jail free, that would have had a serious effect. And I know you've all heard of Dred Scott. Let me tell you something. This case had a far bigger impact on slavery than Dred Scott ever did, right? Dred Scott concerned a fairly narrow question of whether a person who comes with his master to a free state becomes a citizen, right? That's a fairly minute legal question. This case with the Fugitive Slave Act, big. Because once the slave trade was banned and there was basically no more importation of slaves, the way the southern states repopulated was by stealing people from the north, right? So this, as a practical matter, right, all these people taking down Roger Tawney statues. Um, your Joseph Story statues may, may, may be a little bit less uh, vulnerable, but this, this thing had a much bigger impact on slavery than Dred Scott ever did. Now, Dred Scott came later, a couple decades later, so different point in time, but this was a really big decision, because had it come out the other way, all the northern states would have passed similar laws, which would have allowed freed slaves to be emancipated and know they cannot be sent back down river. So um, keep in mind the significance of this decision. Now, uh, we're not here talking only, though, about the Constitution. There's also a statute, I think David mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, Aaron, tell me about the Fugitive Slave Act. What, what was the statute that Congress passed in the, uh, uh, the 93? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I forget the date. Uh, 93, right? 1793. 1793. Uh, no, yes. 1793. I, I have in my notes 73. I know that, that didn't look right, so I meant 93. All right, Aaron. So tell me about this act, the Fugitive Slave Act, 1793. No, describe the act before we get to what the court said. Uh, no, 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 there are two things. There's a Fugitive Slave Clause, and there's the Fugitive Slave Act. I want you to tell me about the Act from 1793. Um, what did the Act do? Boone, you got it? Is it, what, other than, okay, so from the clause of the levy, which, which part are you talking about? The, the Fugitive Slave Act, the act itself. What did the act do? Yeah, Brittany? It was for the return of the slaves from yes. one state to another state to report. Yes, okay, good. So the Fugitive Slave Clause by itself, right, just the clause, that established this, this kind of general language shall be delivered, right? But Congress legislated on the matter. They legislated and they said, we'll provide a specific remedy by which the slaves are actually delivered back down south. Right? So here we're not only talking about an act of the Constitution, an article of the Constitution, there's a statute itself. And the statute itself was passed pursuant to which enumerated power? Brittany, you're next up, perfect. Which enumerated power did Congress rely on to enact the Fugitive Slave Act? You gotta pick one, you always need one bleeding rate of power. Where does Congress get its enumerated powers from, Brittany? From uh, Article 1? Is it only Article 1, though? No. Ah, oh. so which enumerated power did, the, did Congress get to rely on to enact the Fugitive Slave Act? You already said it, you know the answer. Don't fight it, just say it, you know it. Is it the clause? Yes, which clause? 
The fugitive slave act? I mean, freedom of slave clause? Yes, yes, ma'am, exactly. Story says the fugitive slave clause, Article 4, Section 2, was the basis, the enumerated power that allowed Congress to do this. Whenever Congress passes any statute, they have to rely on an enumerated power, right? And I asked you the very f first minute of class, you know, what power did you rely on for the bank? I asked, was it commerce, was it taxing, necessary and proper? With the Bank of the United States, you had to go to an implied power, necessary and proper, right? But here, with the Fugitive Slave Act, they didn't need to go to necessary and proper. They have Article 4 by itself, right? They have Article 4 by itself, specifically, which provision? Delivered, right? Delivered. That, they said, gives Congress the power. Right? So you have the Future Slave Act, but you also have, Alyssa, you also have what else? You have Future Slave Act plus, plus, what's always the plus? There's always something else you can rely on when you're in doubt. Well, you get supremacy, but, but what else? What, what do you usually pair with the enumerated power? Necessary yes, necessary and proper. So story here says, look, you have the future slave clause, that's enough, but you also have necessary and proper. And you see the court will often do this. They'll double dip, right? They'll say, this is probably enough, but just in case, use this other thing, right? It's probably enough for you to use the future slave clause, but you know, when in doubt, throw necessary and proper in there. And he cites Macaulay v. Maryland. Well, he actually doesn't cite it, which was strange, but he basically gives Marshall's reasoning. Um, Joseph's story was a disciple of Marshall. They were very close. Um, but so long as the ends are, are, are appropriate, Congress can use whatever the means are convenient. So the, the, the bottom line here, right, the bottom line of this case is that the court upheld the Fugitive Slave Act. They said it was based on Congress's power under Article 4, Section 2, the Future Slave Clause, and even if there was any doubt, you had necessary and proper, McCullough v. Maryland, let the end be legitimate, let it be within the means, this is there. Um, there there's a lot of important stuff about this case that is totally separate from um, uh, slavery, but at bottom, this is an enumerated power state. And how broadly does the court read it? Now, let's say you had like, you know, a, a textualist in the Supreme Court back then who says, wait a minute, all it says is shall be delivered, right? That's all it says. It says nothing about uh, providing legal safe haven for slave catchers. You could have imagined another opinion saying, nope, this is not valid. In fact, a lot of the abolitionists argued at the time that Article 4 doesn't grant Congress any powers, right? that this merely provides a private cause of action. In other words, that if a slave owner in the South wants to get someone re recovered, they can sue in federal court. They argued this doesn't give Congress any power to, to preempt state laws. But pre became the law of the land. As I mentioned a moment ago, this decision had a lot more practical impact on slavery than Dred Scott ever did. Um, but Tawny statues are, are, are taken down, Story statues remain. I like Justice Story in general, but this is not one of his more uh, popular opinions. People don't know about this. Most, most case books won't even assign this case, but it's, a, it's an important one. All right. Anything else on Prig? Any questions? Anything on Prig? No? Nothing? All right. I'll move on. Um, we move on from... Well, actually, Justice Tawney uh, uh, concurred um, in Prig. We'll come back to Tawney later. And he basically made an argument that was even crazier. He said that states are obligated to assist in the recovery of slaves. He actually went one step further. Um, I don't think anyone joined his concurring opinion, but, but it's there. Okay, Justice Tawney passed away in 1864. Um, that was on the eve, actually the Civil War basically started at that point. Um, and he was replaced by Chief Justice Salmon Chase. Um, Chief Justice Chase was uh, Lincoln's Secretary of the Treasurer, and more importantly, a huge abolitionist. So it was uh, remarkable in that Tawney, who was a, 
uh, uh, he, actually, he actually freed his own slaves, but he was very much pro-slavery as an institution, was replaced by Chief Justice Chase, who was an abolitionist for decades. Um, oh, I forgot to show you this picture. This is actually a graphic of uh, what was a fairly common newspaper advertisement, where you put these in the newspaper and offer rewards for runaway slaves. And it describes them, how tall they are, uh, uh, you know, how, what, what their description is. This one says, not very bright. And uh, return by a certain date, and they give a reward. Um, this is a picture of Chief Justice Chase. Uh, a trivia bit, there are only two Supreme Court justices to appear on currency, Chief Justice Marshall and Chief Justice Chase. Um, Chief Justice State Chase appeared on the greenback. This was an early form of currency. Now, I actually forgot my wallet upstairs, but if all of you take out uh, your wallet, you'll see on currency, legal tender. You ever notice this? Yeah, paper money. Never thought of that. But first, let's do DeWitt. Uh, we'll, get, we'll, get, we'll get to currency in a bit. Uh, who's up next? Uh, okay, uh, Kelsey. Uh, easy enough facts. What were the facts in the U.S. with DeWitt? Um, in 1867, Congress had a law prohibiting um, mixing um, and oils, and essentially um, DeWitt was... What were these oils used for? Illuminating purposes. What does that mean? Light. Light, yeah. So uh, let me let me tell you right. Let me pause in the facts for a minute, right? Um, Congress basically passed a law against using oils to make a light. Does anyone want to take a guess of why Congress enacted this law? Portland, do you want to take a guess? Fire hazard. Okay, fire hazard. Yeah. You want to take another guess? Huh? Nightlife. Nightlife. <laughs> you want to take another guess? Yeah. Yeah, like what? Electricity. Hadn't been invented yet. Well, I didn't want to say it. Candles. <laughs> Who said candles? Yeah, this is probably a lot of Trek candle makers. Um, there, there's a concept um, we'll talk about throughout this class. You probably know as protectionism. They call it rent seeking, right? What is rent seeking? Um, a rent is some sort of valuable item you can get from the government. And very often, interest groups can help ensure laws are passed to protect their industry. Um, so this is the 1860s. And at the time, if you wanted um, light, you would use a candle, right? Which are made from, from animal fats and other different things, make wax, right? Um, this new thing called petroleum, which is a fairly novel idea. So there probably was a public safety rationality. They don't want people blowing themselves up. Uh, if I had to guess why was there a federal law on this, to protect candle makers, I haven't researched this, but that's my, that's my, that's my, that's my guess. Uh, we'll do laws later where Congress bans margarine. Why? To protect the dairy farmers. There's another law where margarine can be dyed pink. That's my favorite one. Make it look disgusting. So no one would want pink margarine. Uh, again, to protect dairy farmers. We'll do a case where Congress bans filled milk, which you probably know as condensed milk. Why? dairy farmers because it's in a can, you don't need to refrigerate it, right? So whenever you see any law that makes no sense, I want you to ask yourself, which industry is this law protecting? Yeah. It, invariably, you'll, you'll, you'll get to the right answer. Uh, I will, I promise you that. So Kelsey, you're right. So they try and ban these forms of oil. Mr. DeWitt sells oil, they have petroleum in uh, Detroit. So what's the question here, Kelsey? Um, does Congress have the power under the Constitution to prohibit trade? Okay, good. Right? So we have here, does Congress have the power under the Constitution to prevent trade? And we have our Commerce Clause, right? So Portland, re read for me the Commerce Clause. We've read it a hundred times, we'll read it a hundred times more. Does Congress have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations among the several states or maybe Indian Okay, so what case did we study last week that interprets this provision of the Constitution? I'm asking you, yeah. We only did like four cases, so you got, you got, a, you got a pretty small, slim uh, pick to choose from. Well, you got to know this. Mark, what case did we do last week? Don't remember the names, remember the facts, but you can actually know names of cases. So, um, we went through Marbury, 
Oh, no, you, you can't use cross elimination. <laughs> <laughs> Which case did we do last week that involves commerce class? We only did one. Um, no. Um, All right, Portland, take another step. Gibbons. Okay, Gibbons, that's right. What was Gibbons about? Don't no, no, no volunteer. Crystal? Um, it was about, it was the New York case Good. about the Monopoly. Uh, Monopoly of? Uh, I don't think so. One at a time, one at a time. Eric? Steamboat. Steamboat, right? What was the issue with the steamboat there? Uh, they've given, uh, New York, uh, Congress has given, uh, either Gibbons or Ogden, whichever one was, a 30-year monopoly on uh, steamboats going from New York to Jersey. All right, good. Uh, and they were saying it was unconstitutional because uh, it was interstate since it was going across. So, so in Marshall's opinion and Gibbons, Eric, did Congress have the power to regulate this ferry market, the steamboat market? Yes. Okay, why? Because it was it was among the states. Okay, it was among the states, right? right. Now, here's the hard part, Eric. I'll keep on you for a minute. Did Marshall's opinion extend beyond a state's borders? Or maybe within a state's borders, I should say. I think, it, I, I think that it said if it was going from an, another state upriver into that state. Good, good. So Marshall defined commerce broadly to mean intercourse, right? The exchange of stuff. But he also said it's not limited to a state's borders, it's intermingled. Yeah, that's the word he used, right? Intermingled. So if it, something goes upriver in a given state, Congress then has the power to regulate it. Okay, so we all know Gibbons, right? Martin. Where was um, the transaction, the sale of oil taking place? Within the states. In this case? Yes. In, in our Did it, is there any allegation that DeWitt crossed state lines in selling his oils? Uh, there was not. Okay. So can Congress then regulate this under its powers of the Commerce Clause? No. So what, what, what's the holding then of DeWitt? It's a fairly short case. Uh, that there, there was not a power to rely on that would allow Congress to uh, enforce this. Therefore, the, the law, the statute is unconstitutional. Okay. So, good. So it's, a, it's you're right, they strike it down. The first point we have to make is, does Chief Justice Chase think this is a commerce among the several states? Or, he does not. Why not? Because it's not going throughout several states. Yeah. So first he says, this commerce, this exchange, is purely intrastate, right? Let me write this out so you, you can hear it, because it's hard. You have interstate and you have intrastate. Interstate means between states. Intrastate means within a state. So the Chief Justice Chase says this is purely intrastate commerce. It's only within one state. Right? Therefore, it's not interstate commerce, and commerce cannot rely on the interstate commerce clause. Everyone get that? They want to see Chief Justice Chase's analysis. But is that the end of our story, uh, Bahara? How do you say it? I'm sorry. Bahara. Bahara. I'll try it. If you pr just <laughs> phonetically later. I, I don't want to. I like to pronounce people's names correctly. Bahara. Um, tell me, please. Do we stop our analysis of the Commerce Clause? Is there something else we can look to? What have we learned so far between McCullough, between Prig? Do we just stop at one clause and say, "Oh, it's unconstitutional"? There's nothing else. Where else can we turn? What, what, do the, what does the government argue in this case to defend their law? They, well, I know that they say that it was because Congress was imposing their internal duties. It, it was nothing more. They didn't have. What are internal duties in English? In modern English, what's a duty? Something that you have to do, that you're obliged to do. Uh, it's a tax. So, what what, uh, what 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 did Congress tax? What did Congress supposed to tax on? Um, to tax production, oil. <clears throat> Good. All right. So here's your argument, right? Uh, Ashley, you're next. Um, if Congress imposed a tax on these oils, 
right? Actually, what's the argument then that they need to have a, a crime of selling these oils? That they need to have a crime of selling them? Why would, why would Congress criminalize the sale of oils which they would otherwise tax? As a way to regulate it? Okay, Emily? I was going to say the same thing. They couldn't prohibit it outright, so they... Well, be careful. What does the opinion say? The opinion says they tax other kinds of oils. So let's just say kerosene. I don't know what it's called. Let's say it's kerosene, right? Let's say that Congress permits the use of kerosene for lighting oils, but they tax that. But then they criminalize petroleum. Are the other staff? Oh, just to keep the, the industry of that oil. Ah, market. yes. In order to dry up the market for petroleum and push people towards kerosene, which was taxed, they criminalize it. Everyone see that? I don't think it was kerosene. I'm making it up, but let's just use my example, right? Kerosene is legal. It was taxed. Petroleum was criminal. It was not taxed. Right? It's kind of like the modern day drug industry where like pharmaceutical drugs and non-pharmaceutical Yeah, yeah. So Congress passes a law to try and shift people into the legal market and keep people out of the illegal market, right? Everyone, like, get the general gist. Now, Emily, I'll go back to you. Does the court find that sort of argument persuasive? Um, I don't think it's so. Why not? It starts talking about like, police regulation. Uh, police regulation. Now, uh, uh, Brittany, uh, this one, Brittany, which clause <laughs> do we have to rely on <coughs> to make the sort of argument that, like, you know, we want people to do this instead of this, we want this market? Which clause of the Constitution lets you get there? Well, we got a couple clauses in this. But which clause of the Constitution says you have this extra power to crimp? Why? Because it's not given specifically, but it's what's necessary for them to be able, able to govern. Very good. Right? So we know that Congress has the power to tax, right? Everyone knows Congress has the power to tax. If Congress wants to tax kerosene, they can do that. There's no dispute whatsoever about that. But if Congress, in order to make their kerosene tax more effective, wants to criminalize petroleum, they have to rely on the necessary and proper clause. Everyone see the relationship, right? They can tax kerosene, no big deal. But in order to make their kerosene tax more effective, they want to criminalize the use of petroleum. For that, they need to rely on necessary and proper. Okay? We studied last week in McCullough that necessary and proper is very broad. We studied 15 minutes ago in Prig. Necessary and proper is really broad. Kelly, is necessary and proper broad enough here to, to cover this sort of law? Does, does Chief Justice Chase find that in order to make their kerosene tax great again, right, they can, they can, they can regulate a, a petroleum under necessary and proper? Can, does it go that far? Why not? Give the right answer. Does the necessary and proper clause stretch far enough to allow criminalization of the sale of, of, of petroleum? Uh, no, I think it, they said because, it, or he said it was because uh, it was the right of the state. Good. Okay, good. So what, what Chief Justice Chase says, it's too remote, right? The connection between the sale of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the taxation of kerosene and the sale of petroleum is too remote. In other words, Congress can't throw someone in jail simply because they want to make their kerosene tax more effective. That the connection between necessary and proper has to be tighter. Right? They won't understand the reasoning. Now, uh, is that China? Yes. China, does this seem consistent with the way that Marshall described the bank tax, uh, the bank, and the way that Story described the future slave back to this? Consistent? What do you think? This this really strict interpretation that you know it, it's they Congress can't do this because it's too remote. I think it goes against what they did. You're right. I think you're right. Why why does it go against Marshall McCullough and Craig with a story? Um, <coughs> I want to say. 
So you think there's a distinction, right? Okay. I think it's different in that in the past cases, um, the law was used to bend in regards to what was. He's saying that it's too remote and too uncertain now. But in the past cases, they were just the same, but they used it in a way. They chose clauses in the Constitution in order to bend towards how they want the law to be. Now, now Jay, let me stand you for a minute. I think you're on the right track. In McCullough, we're talking about what? What was the issue in McCullough? Um, what was like the, the, the main issue? <coughs> um, the tax. The tax of? What were they taxing? They were taxing the state. For? For the, the, um, the United States Bank of State. Okay, good. So McCall involved the federal bank, right? And what, what was the issue in the trade? Um, the um, easier to bank through. Right. So those are both issues national in scale, right? Mm -hmm. What did DeWitt do? He um, marginalized it, and made it more narrow, and said that it's, this is a state. No, no. What, what did the DeWitt, the guy himself, what did he actually do? Why did he go to jail? Oh, for um, <coughs> this. What was his crime? What did he, what did he do? Selling the oil. Selling oil. So you see, in <coughs> other cases, there was a really national interest, right? A national bank, future slaves, right? This is a national concern. But here, he has something local. We have a guy <coughs> selling oil in Detroit. And Justice Story, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not Justice Story. Justice Chase discusses the police power, right? The police power, we'll use this phrase over and over again, refers to a state's ability to protect the health, safety, and wellness, and the morals of the people. Health, safety, wellness, and the morals of the people. This federal law intrudes upon the state police power. It intrudes upon the state police power, and it diminishes the state's authority. So I think why the Chief Justice doesn't find this law to be a proper exercise of federal power is because it intrudes on a traditionally local market. And traditionally, the sale of oil is something that was done by the state and not the feds. Today, it's a different world, right? We'll get there. But back then, the sale of oil in a, in a marketplace was something only by the states to regulate. But uh, I'll get to a second, Andre. But I think Jay's first comment was also right, and I think China as well. The court isn't reading the necessary and proper clause here in the same way that Marshall did and Story did. It's done in a much stricter fashion. And I think what you're beginning to see is the court shifting from the Federalist Court of Marshall to a little bit more um, suspicious of federal power and a little bit more protective of states' rights. You'll see this in next few cases as well. But there, there's a way to explain this by, you know, national interest versus state interest. Also, the court itself shifts a little bit to the right. Um, I just had a question. Yeah. At this point, were there, were like, other than, I guess, treason and stuff, were there federal crimes? Oh, what is the question? What a good question. Not many. Not many. Um, for most of the 19th century, there weren't many federal crimes. They involved maybe, you know, mail fraud, postal fraud, Securities fraud, piracy, um, but your average murder, rape, homicide, battery, trespass, <coughs> those were almost all state offenses. You didn't get the explosion of federal crimes in the 20th century, not so much later. So there weren't many federal crimes to speak of. Yes? Was uh, part of the reason the court started shifting to the right as a reaction to reconstruction of uh, large federal power that was fixed there? Very good question. This was been before Reconstruction. Uh, oh, 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 was it 69? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're right. Uh, I take it back. You're right. Yeah. So that could be part of it. Yeah. I think there was a general hesitancy uh, uh, to, to concern about federal power because it was blowing up. Not, not entirely, but there was a little bit shift to the right on this front. And I use right and left here probably very precisely. There's nothing conservative or liberal back then. The parties have realigned so many times you can't keep track of who's who. But there's definitely a shift away from Marshall's nationalism. Okay. 
Other? A lot of, yeah, sir? What'd you say? Decentralization. Yeah, I call it, yeah, you can call it decentralization. I think, I think that, that's a fair characterization. I'm sorry, I forgot the year. You're absolutely right. 1869, we are in the midst of reconstruction. Or 67, actually. Okay, that might not. Okay. Whatever. Oh, the act was 1867. You're right. Okay. All right. Anything else on, the, on, um, on DeWitt? Easy case, right? But hard to explain. All right. Let's go on to the next case. Uh, Hepburn versus Griswold. Uh, now, this case concerns legal tender. Uh, and all of you have, I think, in your wallet or purse, currency, U.S. currency. And it all says, this is legal tender. Um, and you probably never thought for even more than a minute what that means. Uh, but what it means is you have to accept it if you're a business in the United States, right? If you're a business and someone walks into your store with this piece of paper, they have to accept it. And you may say, oh, what's the big deal, right? Who wouldn't want to accept money? Well, back then, especially in Reconstruction, right after the Civil War, money was worthless. Um, they call these pieces of paper greenbacks, right? When I hold out a, a dollar bill, it's a piece of paper worth like maybe maybe a, a penny, right? It's not worth anything, it's a piece of paper. The reason why it's worth something is because the government of the United States backs up the debt. Um, before paper money became a, a, a common item, the way you would exchange currency was with metal, gold and silver. So you would actually walk into a bank and you give them a piece of gold, bless you, and that's what they use to satisfy your debts. What happened in the legal tender cases with the Legal Tender Act of 1862 is that Congress required all businesses to accept paper money. Even if your debt, that is your loan, says this should be paid back in, in cold or paid back in silver. You don't understand the situation, right? There's no doubt that Congress can print paper money. They can print paper money until they run out of paper, right? They may. The question is does a business have to accept it? Can Congress require businesses to accept paper currency? And that's the issue we have in um, Hepburn versus Griswold. So Rosario, what does the court do in Hepburn, right? What do they, do they say that Congress has the power to make people accept this money? Okay, good. So but before we get to necessary and proper, you're, you're absolutely right the court gets there. Doesn't Congress have the power to coin money and regulate the value of money? Why isn't that enough? Why don't we just stop there? Is that enough to pass this legal tender act? Ah, um, oh, why not? Very good. You're exactly right. Why is the power to coin money and fix it? Well, is it not just making notes, but what, what has to be done with those notes after they're printed? That's the question. Not just issued, but what's the issue in this case, right? Why is this case so difficult? By whom? Who has to accept them? Yes. So the power to coin money only means you can print up the money. But the harder question is can you make people accept it? So here, there's no enumerated power that says, Congress shall make people accept money. The question becomes solely, does the necessary and proper clause give Congress the power to require businesses to accept this paper money? Okay. Now, Adiyami, how do you think Chief Justice Marshall would have approached this question if you were Chief Justice Marshall? Well, I mean, it is an issue, a national issue. Right. Um, and um, I think he would have scratched the necessary and proper clause to his advantage. Yeah, how so? What do you, I mean, what do you think a Marshall opinion would look like? I mean, it's not hard to think of. What, um, how would he have structured that? <laughs> You're on the right track. So if you say it's a national issue, what would Marshall say? How can Congress have the power to, to, to do the paper money? Um, I would base it off the tax cost. Good. Um, because you know, if you're going to have a tax, you're going to have to pay the tax. Um, and 
I'm going to pass the business or so forth, there needs to be a consistency or a reflection. Yeah. If I want to pay the government, for example. Uniformity, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. I think that's exactly, right? So if I'm John Marshall, right, this opinion takes me five minutes to write. Well, Congress has the power to regulate commerce, and Congress has the power to tax, and Congress has the power to coin money. And that suggests you want a nationwide system where any piece of currency can be accepted in any business to have uniform taxation rates. So as a convenient way of accomplishing that nationwide uniform commercial system, Congress can require paper money to be accepted. Everyone see that, right? It took me, what, 20 seconds to do it. John, that's not the opinion we got here, is it? No. So what's the opinion we got here? Um, instead, we're looking at, uh, well, the opposite is not necessary problem. Why does Chief Justice Chase think this is not necessary and proper? The, uh, well, I think that, is there a particular reason why it's not going to have to be? That's that my question. Is? Why Why does Chase think you can't squeeze this in under necessary and proper? <coughs> One at a time, please. <coughs> Why has this not been a necessary proper? What what's the problem here? He uses a very specific phrase he uses. I didn't see, I, from what I understand, they couldn't convince themselves. They couldn't find a reason uh -huh. to persuade themselves of a, yeah. a core right. issue. Rachel, want to take a step? Um, Why is this law not proper? I'm not. I'm not really sure. From what I understand, it might just be an incidental power, so it's not really based. Or it's. Um, let me see. It expands, I guess, the power of the federal government to issue paper money. Want to take a stab, Lindsay? Well, we rotate your computer. I couldn't figure out what were you doing there. I have the book on here, but it's not rotating. So. You can't rotate. You can rotate the file. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. So. I'll show you later. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> 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 I don't know off the bat. I have to. Um. <coughs> what? It was by Justice Chase. Why does Chase think that this doesn't fit under necessary and proper? What? Why does this not meet the test of McCullough in Maryland? Um, is it because he's saying that the means is not appropriate and consistent with the Constitution? Uh, not, uh, you missed the key word. The spirit. Yes, thank you. Oh, you jumped on the key <coughs> word. Yes. Marshall writes, right? The means must be not prohibited but consistent with the letter and spirit of the Constitution. This act, he writes, is inconsistent <coughs> with the spirit of the Constitution. What on earth does that mean? And everyone, Benjamin, up top. What on earth does that mean? It's not consistent with the spirit of the Constitution. My God, I, I know there's a spirit clause. I missed that. There's a finger spirit clause. So what, what, what is he talking about? Uh, Okay, good. And how it's not going to, so it doesn't serve the needs of the necessary and proper clause for commerce because paper money is not a stable currency. What's problematic, right? Uh, is that, I can't see the name tag. There you go, Daniel. Thank you, sir. What's problematic, Daniel, about making people who give out a loan to pay back the gold now required to take back the full paper money? Mm -hmm. Worthless. Uh, what does this do to a value of you? If you're a bank and you give out a bank of gold and I got to pay back on this worthless paper, right? What does that do then to your, your bottom line? 
Things are valuable. Yeah. He's basically saying that this is taking away a property with a due process of law, right? Remember that? You can't be deprived of life, liberty, or property with a due process of law. He's saying that this law diminishes the value of loans and diminishes the value of debt. And therefore, as a result, as a result, it's not proper. Right? He says, it is difficult to conceive what act would take private property without due process of law. Right? This is not a legitimate act of Congress. <coughs> so this, again, is it, it squares with the text of McCullough, right? Marshall wrote about the spirit of the Constitution, which probably none of you paid attention to when you read McCullough last week. But here, the court seizes on that, and he says there's this limitation. And if something is not consistent with the spirit of the Constitution, it doesn't fit under necessary and proper. Therefore, it's unconstitutional. <coughs> uh, oh, you're next, Andre. Yes, sir. Oh, I just thought, could you clarify what you mean a little more about the spirit? I wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> you read the opinion just the same I did. Do you know what that means? I'll I'll give you I'll give you a hint right. Um, I can guess. Good, go go guess, please. That, I'll give you an answer in a second. That it's the responsibility of the Constitution to take care of the nation as a whole. Okay. And look after the nation's best interests, not not specific states. So I think the answer is, and he doesn't really describe this, but if some sort of law of Congress violates some sort of uh, a, a principle that the judges find valuable. It goes too far. I know that's not helping much. But here he says, because this law is depriving people of the value of their property, it goes against a basic principle. Is that principle written anywhere? It is. It's in the Fifth Amendment. Um, why doesn't he just say this law violates the Fifth Amendment? Because it's a, uh, a, a challenge to this, um, uh, you know, this legal tender act. Um, but we'll do other cases later in the semester. Again, I keep coming back to the Obamacare case, we'll come back to others, where the court finds that there's a limit on what Congress can do. And that making someone buy insurance, here making someone accept paper money, that goes too far. Uh, invariably, there's a line drawing question, and these are not clear lines. Your, your question, like, what's the spirit of the Constitution? I don't know. Hell if I know. Uh, but the court identified a limit, and this represents a bigger break with Story and Marshall. On uh, page 170, he mentions the, um, the old Congress under the Articles of Confederation. Uh -huh. And could you maybe infer that the spirit of the Constitution is kind of in response to the mistakes that were made with the Articles? Possibly, yeah. I mean, that, that's a good theory. Um, but I think the, the what really drives his opinion is his discussion of the Civil War. Right? Um, he says, laws passed during the tumult, right, the chaos, the Civil War. Um, at the time, people who were doubters maybe were quiet. But now the war is over. We can look at this with a more uh, sober lens. The irony there is at the time this law was enacted, Chase was the Secretary of the Treasury. Chase hated paper money, but he backed this law. And he basically said, I backed it because otherwise we're going to default on our bills and we couldn't pay our bills. So he's basically saying, yeah, I support this law that was unconstitutional, uh, but it was due to the chaos of the war. Which is a, it's a striking thought. He's basically saying, yeah, I was wrong. Um, people don't like admitting they're wrong, but here Chase did. So we have here where I want you to think about the implications of this, though. The paper money had been in effect for some time, right? A number of years. And here the court's saying, uh, yeah, all those transactions with paper money are now void. Just think about that for a minute. For years throughout the war, banks were being forced to accept this paper money instead of actual gold, which has value. And now it's like, just kidding, it's all void. This was a very disruptive opinion. And it would not last very long. Barely a year later, I think this is in your reading, in a case called Knox against Lee, um, the court reversed itself. Now, the actual vote in Hepfer v. Griswold was four to three. What? How do you have a four to three vote? Due to deaths and resignation, the court was down. 
So there are only four justices in the majority. In the year after <coughs> Hepburn was decided, there were two new justices appointed. And both of those justices were pro-paper money. And almost immediately, like less than a year later, a four to three decision flipped. It became a five to four decision the other way. And the court ruled that the paper money, the Legal Tender Act, was constitutional. And the analysis, which I didn't have you read because it's pretty, pretty easy to predict, is necessary and proper. Congress has the power to regulate commerce, to coin money, to tax, to declare war. And having a single paper legal tender is a necessary and proper <coughs> means to execute those powers. If we want a national economy, we can have paper money that's easy to transport, accepted everywhere. So Chief Justice Chase's opinion, which took us some time to digest, barely lasted a year. And that's why you all have paper money in your wallets uh, that is not worth much. Now, even after um, the, the legal tender cases, if you brought a piece of paper currency to a Federal Reserve Bank or a U.S. Treasury, they would give you gold. Right? You could actually bring your paperbacks to a bank and they give you gold. So for all the fear that this paper money is worthless, it was at least backed up by gold. Um, President Roosevelt changed that policy in order to experiment with monetary policy. And he said, you cannot exchange your paper bills for gold. There was another case in the 1940s called the gold, the, 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 the gold clause case, the gold tender case, drawing a blank on the name, where the court said, yes, all this paper money, which used to be worth gold, is now worth nothing, and you can't do anything about it. That's a hard case to justify, but uh, that's why when you have paper money in your wallet, you cannot get gold for it. So if you bring uh, like a silver certificate into the bank, it's they don't they're not required. To well, a silver certificate's not. I'm talking about a piece of green currency, right? A dollar bill. Like but back in the day, if you had a, a $50 bill and you brought that to a bank, they give you the equivalent of gold. But, but I mean, I, I have like old silver certificates that look like dollar bills, but they're backed by silver. Uh, so what are they from? 1910s. Uh. Yeah, I don't know. Ask me that later. I'm not sure. I don't want to check up on that. Cash them out. <laughs> Might be too late. I don't know. All right. So any other questions on Hepburn, right? The rule there is the court says that necessary and proper doesn't stretch so far to require banks to take this money. But that decision lasted barely a year. In um, the, the Knox case, the court reversed that, saying that, yes, Congress has the power to require Paper money, it's a convenient means to have a national currency, commerce, necessary and proper, coining money, declaring war, throw it all together, plus necessary and proper, and you get your legal tender act. I mean, you can see, right? If I were to ask you an exam to write an opinion like Marshall or Story, or if I were to ask you to write an opinion like Chase on necessary and proper, you can see how they approach this in a very different way. Marshall says, yeah, throw everything you want, necessary and proper is fine. Chase is very skeptical of this, and it's a very cramped reading of the clause. Uh, yes, Andre. So, just to follow up, if I had, okay, so if I had a hundred dollar, I guess maybe a ten dollar bill from 1910, and I took it to a bank, are they going to give me the ten ten dollars in new money, or what it's worth in inflation? Uh, you're going to get $10 in whatever $10 is today. You need 10 bucks. You don't get inflation. Which is why, one of the reasons why Russell did this, keeping cash is a terrible investment because of inflation. It's not good to keep cash. Um, put in a bank, which is one of the reasons why Russell wanted to inject more money into the capital system and banks went broke. Right? People used to keep you know, cash under their mattresses, right? That's not a very good way to save it. So is that what he meant when he talked about it getting value over time? Yeah, paper money loses the value, it has to. When it's pegged to a physical currency like gold, it, it's a little bit more stable, but that's not our monetary policy today. Doesn't he need to know the different justices from um, point of view of Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yes, yes. Pay very close attention to the justices. Learn them, love them, hate them. Um, <laughs> mostly the latter. Uh, but you'll need to know them and their approaches. Um, you only need to know the justices we talk about in class, but whoever writes the opinion, you should know who they are and what they believe. Yeah? So, maybe not the dissents? Oh, the dissents as well. Okay, I just didn't, I didn't know. Absolutely. The dissents are often more important than the majority opinions. 
Very often the dissents win the day. Um, there was actually a three justice dissent, I don't think it's in your book, with the Knox case, I'm sorry, with, uh, with uh, Hepburn. Uh, and then basically the three justices in dissent a year later became the majority. So here's a case within a year, a dissent becomes the majority. Yeah, you got you know the justices. Love them, hate them, whatever you're doing, <coughs> know them. Okay, anything else on Hepburn or Knox? Anything else on Hepburn or Knox? Okay, hold on. The next uh, topic focuses on the progressive era. Um, <coughs> for those of you who have studied history, um, the progressive era is somewhat difficult to define um, because for a lot of different interests. But if I could lump together in gross generalities, um, one of the defining characteristics of the progressive era was the idea that you can use the power of government to make progress, right? That's progressive progress, right? It's you could use the power of government to make progress. And that often took the form of um, sanitation laws. You may have heard of the jungle, Upton Sinclair, the muckrakers, right? Uh, you often had very dirty <coughs> facilities being used to process food. And yeah, the Upton Sinclair wrote this book called The Jungle about the meatpacking facility, I think it was in Chicago. Uh, people said, oh my god, our food's so dirty. You know, it used to be that we would get food on the farm nearby, it was all local. Now you have these massive slaughterhouses where uh, all the food's getting dirty, so you pass uh, laws concerning health and safety. Uh, the progressives also focus on labor. Um, they would focus on uh, minimum wage laws, maximum hour laws, uh, workplace safety laws, worker compensation, um, you know, whatever sort of social laws you think of, they probably began their genesis during the progressive era. Um, some of these laws were at the state level, and some of these laws were at the federal level. We'll return to the state laws later in the semester when we do the due process clause. The court would find limitations on these various state progressive laws on the due process clause, find that they take liberty, that's what's called the liberty of contract and property, away from workers without due process of law. That is, a law requiring you to pay a minimum wage actually harms the worker, because the worker may want to have a lower wage to work more hours, whatever it happens to be. Today, we focus on federal laws that were progressive in nature. And these are all um, laws concerning the progressive era. The first case, United States versus E.C. Knight, concerns the Sherman Antitrust Act. Uh, you may have heard of this or studied this in college, uh, but the Antitrust Act was designed to break down monopolies. That is, big is bad. If a company got too big, it was bad. And then it would be up to the federal government to bring a, a charge to, to bring down this conglomerate. Uh, the second case, uh, uh, Hammer versus Dagenhart, I'm sorry, um, mm -hmm. except one. The third case, Hammer versus Dagenhart, concerned um, uh, child labor, right? Uh, we don't think about that too much now, but it was actually a fairly big issue, right? Could children who were 16 work full time? Could children who were, uh, you know, 14 work full time? 12 even, right? And a number of states tried to criminalize child labor or regulate its conditions, and then Congress got in the act. Uh, the middle case fits into this uh, somewhat indirectly, which involves a, a lottery, uh, the Champion versus Ames case. Um, can Congress prohibit the exchange of lottery tickets? And, and today, we don't think much of lottery. Every state has one. What's the Powerball? 650 million something today, right? How much is it now? 700 million. I've never put a lottery ticket in my life. I have no interest in doing so. Uh, Godspeed to those who do. Uh, I think in both we have a greater chance of being murdered than winning the Powerball. Uh, I read that recently. Um, so, <laughs> it's true. Um, uh, yeah, I think you, you, in Baltimore you have to buy 100,000 lottery tickets, the equivalent, that's equalized the rate of being murdered uh, uh, in Baltimore. Anyway, odds are against you, ever in your favor. Um, 
But the lottery ticket at the time were viewed as very immoral. That it was a basically a tax on the poor, you're taking money away from people, you're taking <coughs> advantage of them. And gambling was always a present presence. So the question here is not whether Congress can criminalize child labor or lottery tickets. I'm sorry, the question is not whether states the question is not whether states can criminalize child labor or lottery tickets or antitrust monopolies. The question is whether Congress can do them. And what we'll see in the first and the third case, not the second one, is a fairly narrow reading of federal power. The second case provides a fairly broad one. And you may ask, what's the difference between child labor and lottery tickets? It's, they're hard to square. So I want to get that out there at the outset. So, Who's next? Andre next or Jonathan? Okay, Andre, give me the facts in Easy Night, please. Um, there were there was a trade monopoly in the sugar refinery, sugar, company, yeah. American sugar refinery company. Four companies uh, that were competitors with them had obtained the control of all the sugar refineries <coughs> in the United States, with the exception of the Revere of Boston and the refineries of the four defendants of Boston. Good. Okay. So basically, you had a situation where there were a couple companies that that dominated the sugar manufacturing industry, and then like they wanted to merge, which would have given one um, trust, as they were called, excuse me, virtually unlimited control over sugar in the United States. And the theory was, when you have one company that runs an entire industry, they will raise prices and put everyone else out of business. The numbers don't exactly support that. In some cases, monopolies have scale and they can lower prices, but that was the prevailing economic theory at the time. All right, Jonathan, so what happened next? Uh, the government tried to use the Sherman Act to block the uh, acquisition. Good, okay. So what was then the question, right? What, what did the sugar company say in response to this, this move? You were in the sugar company. What was the response to this? This new law, this new Sherman Act, like a couple years old. I don't understand what you just said. Try it again. What What's the holding of the case? The holding is federal law cannot be applied because of monopoly in the production. In your own words now. Um, you need a distinction between the manufacturing and commerce. Instead. Okay, good. So, uh, Zach, let me ask you this question. What clause of the Constitution does Congress rely on here to enact the Sherman Act? Um, the MSA Congress. Good. Right, so Congress has the power to regulate commerce among the several states. And we've already talked about Gibbons v. Ogden and what does among mean, and it can go into one state or the other. Now, is there any doubt that these firms are shipping sugar around the world, or around the country at least? Okay, then why is that not commerce among the several states? Uh, because they're buying the property and they're buying the sugar and they're looking to sell. What does the trust law concern? Does it concern the shipment of sugar? What exactly is the sugar company here guilty of? Um, what What are they being charged with? They were trying to restrain the trade. How? By pretty much having the power of the Power of doing what to sugar? Price control. Power of what? Mm -hmm. Anthony? Manufacturing. <coughs> Is manufacturing the same thing as distribution, Anthony? No. Why not? Manufacturing is making it. Making it. And then what comes after that? Then you ship it out. Ah. So here the court draws a distinction between manufacturing and commerce. The court says commerce is inter intercourse, right? The exchange of goods. 
there's no doubt that after the sugar is made, it goes across state lines. However, this is the big however. Here, the monopoly concerns manufacture of sugar, and manufacture is not commerce. So here, the court doesn't really get into givens, right? About inter among whatever they say. This statute, this trust, is only a trust because of manufacturing and not of commerce. And they draw this distinction between direct and indirect. This is an indirect regulation of commerce, which Congress lacks the power to do. Congress can only directly regulate commerce. They cannot indirectly regulate the stuff that comes before commerce. Okay, so let me ask you a question. Do we usually stop our analysis at the Commerce Clause, or do we usually keep going? Keep going. We usually keep going, right? Where do we keep going? What's our next stop in our, in our, uh, on our tour? What other clauses we should go to whenever we, <coughs> we uh, get to the Commerce Clause? It doesn't give us enough. What would John, what would John Marshall say? What would Joseph Story say? Necessary and proper. Exactly. So give me a John Marshall opinion of holding the Sherman Act. Or give me a John Marshall Harlan named after him. Opinion well, of holding the Sherman Act. Commerce, um, but to regulate commerce, we must be able to stop monopolies and stop monopolies. Yeah. See how easy that was, right? It took you five seconds. For the dissent, right, by Justice John Marshall Harlan, who is named after Justice. Marshall. And even cooler, John Marshall Harlan's grandson was also a justice named John Marshall Harlan II. So you got pretty good lineage there. And here, Justice John Marshall Harlan I is true to his namesake. And he says, necessary and proper. McCulloch v. Maryland, right? Even if Congress doesn't have the power to regulate manufacture under the Commerce Clause, in order to give effect to their power of commerce regulation, you should be able to use necessary and proper to reach manufacture, right? That necessary and proper says, okay, we'll let you regulate manufacturing to prevent the shipment of monopolistic sugar. If you want to regulate the shipment of monopolistic sugar, you need to get it manufactured. And to get manufactured, we rely on necessary and proper, McCulloch v. Maryland, Freakview, Pennsylvania, not cited. They don't cite Prig anyway. It never gets cited, but it's there. Right? So Harlan's dissent is saying, look, you guys, you're ignoring John Marshall. Right? This is commerce plus necessary and proper. I don't even think um, Harlan believes this entire manufacturing commerce distinction. That seems artificial, right? Kind of made that up. He's saying commerce is commerce, involves commercial activity, and this is included in it. Let the end be legitimate, let it be within the scope of the Constitution, and all means which are appropriate, which are plainly adapted to that end, <coughs> which are not prohibited, but consistent with the letter and spirit of the Constitution. And he says this is consistent with the spirit of the Constitution. Right? <coughs> so, Carlo, again, how do we square away E.C. Knight with McCullough in Maryland? What, what's our, how do we square this case away? <coughs> I mean, is, is Harlan crazy here, or, or, or is the majority crazy? I mean, how do we reconcile E.C. Knight with McCulloch in Maryland. Well, just, um, Does the majority even talk about necessary and proper? No. Did anyone notice that? We're doing a reading like, wait, the majority doesn't even mention McCulloch, right? Why do you think they haven't even cited Carlo? I think if they probably did, they would have been Yeah, yeah, I, I, see, I see you're nodding there, Kevin. What do you think? I think because um, it goes back to the very beginning with Palmer. Is it Palmer or not? And then from there we can step off. 
do, now, now, do you think that uh, the court here thinks that McCullough is correctly decided? Congress probably does. They well, Congress loves as much power as they want. But you think here the court thought that McCullough was correctly decided? No. So here's the thing about John Marshall, right? He wasn't necessarily correct. Today, his decisions are revered as if they were. Uh, but but E.C. Knight is openly defying Marshall, right? There, you, you can draw a distinction, oh, manufacture, you know, <coughs> commerce, whatever, right? But once you get to necessary proper land, right, if Congress has the power to regulate monopolistic sugar being shipped across the country, then they absolutely have the greater power to ensure that's not manufactured in the first place. Right? If they can prevent the shipment of monopolistic sugar, they can prevent it from being made in the first place. This is like the oil case, right? They said, oh, we want to tax, uh, we want to ban uh, petroleum so we can tax kerosene. And the court said, no, 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 you can't do that. So E.C. Knight is consistent with DeWitt, the oil case. It's really hard to square away and reconcile with um, Marshall in McCulloch, Maryland. And here you have Harlan by himself screaming, saying, what are you guys doing? This is a massive law designed to remedy a social ill, a social ill that, David, can any one state stop monopoly? Did any one state regulate monopoly effectively? Ah, and generally, how, how far do monopolies stretch? I guess it kind of depends on the industry, but I mean, it could be nationwide. Nationwide. Usually monopolies are, right? For a monopoly to be effective, it's probably going to have offices in all 50 states, however many, how many states to work at this point. So Harlan makes another point. He says, look, not only is McCulloch and Maryland correct here, but when there's a nationwide problem, right, a bank, slavery, whatever, this is something that Congress ought to be the one regulating. You can't restrict it to a local government, right? There's sort of a collective action problem, right? You need the entire nation to crack down on these sugar monopolies. So Harlan says, this is a national interest. It involves commerce among the several states. And even if those three things weren't clear, you got necessary and proper, without any doubt. So E.C. Knight, and I'll, I can say this very candidly, is hard to square away with McCulloch in Maryland. It's, it's, it's intention. And I think all of you, all of you see that, right? It, it's not, <laughs> it doesn't follow Marshall's route. And it's basically saying, Marshall went too far. Um, this case was overruled some 20 something years later, or maybe 30 years later, in a decision called United States versus Darby. Uh, we'll say that one later. And another decision called uh, National Labor Relations Board, NLRB, versus Jones and Laughlin Steel. So this case would not live for long. Uh, for a period of about three decades, the court tried to draw a distinction between direct regulations of commerce and indirect regulations of commerce distinction between commerce and manufacture. They tried drawing these lines, um, and they, they seem artificial, they are. Uh, but eventually, following or during the New Deal, the court said, uh, we're out of this business, right? We're not gonna draw these lines. Let's go back to Marshall, and maybe a little bit further, perhaps. Okay. So any questions on EC Knight? <clears throat> All right, the next case, Champion against Ames, which is often called the lottery case. You can call it the lottery case, it'll make it easier for you to remember. Uh, but Champion versus Ames. All right, Adam, give me the facts. Um, <clears throat> Congress uh, enacted this act to make it illegal to transport or sell water tickets across state lines. Okay. And um, defendants were subsequently arrested and convicted for. Lottery yeah, they were shipping Paraguayan lottery tickets from Texas to California, right? And they were violating this act of Congress. Now, Adam, is a lottery ticket by itself commerce? No. No. Good. So then why does Harlan, this was a 5-4 decision, by the way, 
Why does Harlan, or the majority opinion here, find that Congress has the federal power to do this? What is commerce here? It's not the lottery ticket itself. What is the commerce? It's the, um, they were independent carriers. Ah, the carrying, right? So the act of commerce here, the act of intercourse, if you will, is the transportation of the lottery tickets from one state to the next, right? The actual, the actual ticket by itself <coughs> is not commerce. So, Brandon, let me ask you this question. Could Congress criminalize the mere possession of a lottery ticket? Not the shipment of interstate, but merely possessing it, a lottery ticket. Okay. okay, the answer is no under this case. I'll ask you another question. Can Congress criminalize, criminalize if you have a marijuana plant in your backyard? Yes. Why? Uh, uh, you just said they can't criminalize you having a lottery ticket in your pocket. They can criminalize you having a joint in your pocket. Well, I guess all laws presuppose morality to some extent. What's morality? Oh, I thought we would get it until the 14th Amendment. We got it early, right? What's what's morality? What the Congress deems is right. Which what we what's that phrase used earlier about the power of government to regulate the health, safety, welfare, and morals? What what do we call that? They call it give it a name. Due process? No. Yeah, pretty the police power, right? So I said earlier the police power is the power of the government to regulate the health, safety, welfare, and morals of the people. Brandon, back to you. Does Congress have a police power? Does Congress have the power to regulate morality? Well, again, I would say that all laws are presupposed by morality. Where does Congress get its powers from? From the Constitution. And does the Constitution give Congress a morality clause? Again, I would say they're presupposed. You're, you keep saying that, but it's wrong. <laughs> states. The states have a police power. Brandon. The states have a police power. Where do states get their police power from? Constitution. Do the states exist before the Constitution? Well, the Constitution leaves any power not enumerated in the Constitution to the states. Right, but did the states have any power before the Constitution was ratified? Where did the states come from? This is actually useful. Where did the states come from? What, what were they before they were states? What were they called? Um, colonies. Colonies, right. And what did the colonies do in 1776? They, uh, they're, they're independent. Good. And what was the consequence of declaring independence? What powers then did now the colonies and the states assert? What powers did they assert? Yeah. Well, what powers did they then claim as a result of declaring independence? Um, all sovereign powers? From whom? Who had those powers previously? England? Yes! Right. Here's how it works. July 3rd, 1776, right? The 13 colonies had no powers under their own. England had all the power. But upon declaring independence, the colonies became states. <coughs> and as states, they assumed all the powers of the crown. So each power then, I'm sorry, each state gained a police power to regulate their own health, safety, welfare, and morals. Right? But when the states ratified a constitution, they gave up. They relinquished some of that police power. And they gave certain aspects of that police power to the federal government. Among those powers, the power to regulate commerce, the power to coin money, the power to declare war. The states gave up some of their sovereign authority to the federal government. But as the 10th Amendment reminds us, any power not expressly, not expressly, it's not there, articles, any power not delegated to the central government is retained by the states and the people. So the significance of that is the states have the power to regulate morality, and 
Brandon's exactly right. If Texas wants to criminalize marijuana possession, there's no question they can do that. But in order for Congress to do that, they need to rely on an enumerated power in Article 1, Section 8. They want to ban oil. They want to ban child labor. They want to ban marijuana. They want to do anything local. They can't rely on the mere pretext of morality. They need to rely on an enumerated power. So I asked Brandon is some of a trick question, right? <clears throat> he answered the first one correctly. Can Congress ban the mere possession of a lottery ticket? Well, that's not commerce. Can Congress ban the possession of a marijuana plant in your background, uh, in your backyard? Plant never crossed state lines, you have local seeds, etc. We'll do later, the answer is yes, they can. And I'll tell you the answer. It's not just commerce, right? Merely possessing a plant or merely possessing a lottery ticket is not commerce. But if Congress wants to regulate the nationwide market for marijuana, if Congress wants to regulate the nationwide market for lottery <coughs> tickets, if Congress wants to regulate the nationwide market for sugar, as a necessary and proper way of doing so, they need to reach the local marijuana. They need to reach the local lottery ticket. They need to reach local sugar manufacturer. That is how necessary and proper works in our system, right? That the commercial act by itself is not enough, but to regulate the national market under necessary and proper, they go local. And this is something that most people simply don't appreciate. They say, oh, commerce, whatever, no, no. It's commerce plus the necessary and proper. Brand, I picked on you enough. You're welcome to pick on me now. Well, I, I guess what I was asking is what what do you think gives them the power? Who's them? Gives the, the colonies or the yeah, the colonies the power to give themselves the power. So let's go back to the declaration, right? Yeah, yeah with you. And I guess that's what I was saying uh -huh. was because they point back to the creator, that's where morality uh -huh. first enters. I don't know if I'm even making so if you turn to page 22 in your constitutions, right? Actually, the bottom of page 21 of your declarations, right? It says, we, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress assembled, appeal to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these United Colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states that they are absolved from all allegiances to the crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Britain is not to be dissolved. And here comes the big part. And as free and independent states, they have full power to leave you war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all their acts and things which independent states may have right to. That is Jefferson, right? By the act of independence under this natural law theory, they are assuming the powers of sovereign states that formerly belonged to the crown. They are now their own police. And by forming this union, this Continental Congress, they delegated certain powers to this central government to retain all others for themselves. But your answer about morality is good, though, right? Amber, what role does Justice Harlan see in morality with respect to the lottery tickets? Well, I mean, at the time, they were seen as very wrong. A pestilence, right? A pestilence. It's like, a, like, 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 like you know, the, the locust from the plague in the Bible, right? They had these pestilence, right? W where does morality play into the Constitution? I just, I just yelled at Brandon saying, we don't have a morality clause, right? Where does morality play in Harlan? Um, I mean, I would say that Where do you think anything fits in the Constitution when you're finding Congress of power? Where does everything fit in? Article 1. Which, which clause? Section 8. There's no morality clause. What kind of clause do we have? You, you can't go wrong by giving this answer. <laughs> you, you can't go wrong. Necessary and proper. Yeah, necessary and proper. When, whenever you're in doubt, just say necessary and proper, you're probably right. You have to explain why. So we get some partial credit, but you can't. 
You can't go wrong by giving you the necessary and proper clause, right? So what Harlan says, right, is that we have here a national problem. This pestilence, this pestilence, right? What's going on? Okay. This pestilence of lottery tickets is sweeping the land with this national problem. And Congress has the power to regulate its interstate movement under the Commerce Clause, but it's made even stronger by necessary and proper. That lest there be any doubt, Congress has the power to eradicate this national pestilence which are plaguing our people and interfering with interstate commerce. Right? We don't need to lay down a bright line rule or predict any future cases. All we have to decide here is that lottery tickets are the subject of traffic from one state to another, and Congress has authority over such commerce and may prohibit it. Now, David, the Constitution says Congress can regulate commerce. Does that give it the power to criminalize it and prohibit it? What does Harlan say? Let's get those important words. Congress can regulate commerce and they prohibit it. What does Harlan say? Do you know? Can Congress prohibit commerce, or can they merely regulate it? They can, they can prohibit it, but it's not served for any greater good. Uh, well, what do you mean greater good? I mean, the, like, I mean, it's a, they can prohibit it if it was injurious to the public world. Uh, well, let me, let me explain like this. The phrase in the Constitution is regulate. Harlan doesn't seem to think regulate and prohibit mean much of a difference because of the necessary and proper clause again, right? As a necessary means to regulate lottery tickets, they should be able to ban it. Prohibit it outright. Think back to the oil case, right? If Congress wants to regulate the oil market, why could they ban kerosene? So here we're simply seeing different readings of necessary and proper. You how stretchy, how elastic can you get it? Okay. The dissent by Justice uh, who was it? Was it Fuller, yeah, by Chief Justice Fuller, says that the regulation of uh, lottery tickets is a matter for the states. This is a state police power, and it's actually a violation of the Tenth Amendment to intrude, right? Because what happens if Texas wants to import lottery tickets, right? What happens if California, the government, wants people shipping a lottery ticket? When the feds step in, they step out the states, right? When the feds regulate something, the states cannot. If California wants the importation of lottery tickets, by virtue of the statute, it doesn't matter because it's a crime. So any expansion of federal power necessarily requires the contraction of state power. And the dissent says that this is a violation of the Tenth Amendment and a lottery ticket is not commerce. And at the very end, the court, the dissent basically says, look, if this is allowed, right, if you can regulate this because of morality, everything's commerce. <coughs> this breaks down the differences between the federal government and the state government, there are no differences left. This will wipe out all traces of state lines and create a centralized government. Wow, that's pretty serious, right? It's going to wipe out all traces of state lines. So the dissent here was not messing around, right? They said once you allow this sort of broad reading of commerce and necessary and proper, there's nothing the federal government can't do. And in that respect, they were probably right, uh, as we'll see later. Yes, Adiyami. Um, you, uh, you said earlier that this, this, this case is still right? Champion the aims, no, this is still good law. So how would that work in the matter of marijuana, for example, in states where medical marijuana oh, is Oh, I'm so legal. glad you asked that question. And we'll do grow. medical marijuana in about a week or so. Okay. We'll get there, I promise. Uh -huh. The case will get Zalos That's okay. Just, but it's, it's okay, we'll get there, I promise. <laughs> just to clear that. <laughs> just, just to clear the air? Just to clear that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a little hazy issue, so. Um, <laughs> So this is good law, right? And, and Champion the Ames has understood that the mere lottery ticket is not commerce, 
But the shipment of a lottery ticket across state lines is interstate commerce. But more importantly, under the Necessary and Proper Clause, they can not only regulate the manner in which it's transported, but prohibit it and criminalize it, make it a crime to ship lottery tickets. Okay? Anything else on EC Night? I'm sorry, um, uh, uh, Champion Games. Last case, right on schedule. Hammer versus Dagenhart. Uh, who's next? Aaron, give me the facts of Hammer, please. Um, a father wanted his two sons, one who was under 14, and one who was under 14, 16, so one who was workforce for the mill. Yeah. So, so, wait, step back a minute. Here we have a father suing the federal government to allow his children to work in a mill. Does this be a strike with odd? Good answer, yeah. Um, today we think it's, of course, it's awful that kids are working, but this was in a pretty bleak economic era. And a 16 year old best contribution was probably not going to college at the time, but working was on the uh, shelf, right? Um, so it seems crazy. Uh, I doubt the kids had any say in this, they probably want to go to school. But at the time, parents were actually um, frustrated that their kids couldn't contribute to the workforce. And they were challenging a federal law that put limitations on child labor. And said if any manufacturing, right, any manufacturing concern made goods that were advanced by child labor, they couldn't ship those goods in interstate commerce. Now we studied earlier, right, in the, um, uh, uh, in EC Knight, there's a difference between manufacturing and commerce. A lot of people thought that the Champion the Ames case overruled that and said, no, 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 we're going to go full necessary and proper, right? Aaron, does this case follow the lottery ticket approach or does it follow EC Knight? How do, what is this case closer to? I think the lottery. Well, the lottery case have a broad or narrow vision of federal power? What was holding the lottery ticket case? Pardon? What was the holding the lottery ticket case? Uh, they said that uh, it can't be suppressed. Good. The lottery case was sort of a broad interpretation. They said that Congress can prohibit it. So, so is this case, so is, is, is a, a hammer versus a closer to the lottery ticket or closer to the EC9? EC9. Why is it closer to EC9? That's correct. Uh, because the lottery case. <laughs> let them kind of dip into the state's action. And then in this one, uh, they said no, it's too invasive on the actions inside the state. Yeah. Good. So the court here in Hammer versus Dagnar, this case, by the way, was also overruled some years later. Uh, but you need to know it. Um, the court says that the mere, I'm sorry, this case is not about regulating commerce, right? This case in no way concerns the shipment of the goods. This is really a law about labor conditions, right? The purpose of this law is to suppress labor conditions, to suppress child labor. It doesn't regulate how the furniture is transported or how anything else is uh, transported. The goods themselves are harmless. And in fact, the goods can still be shipped 30 days after the removal from the factory. So you can still ship goods made with child labor just 30 days later. So the court says here is that this is an attempt by Congress to effectuate a police power. <clears throat> they are regulating purely local matters. Now today we think of, you know, labor conditions as of course it's a federal matter, right? But back then, labor conditions were a local matter. And the court says not only does this go beyond its commerce powers, it's a violation of the Tenth Amendment, which we haven't seen before, right? But because it intrudes on the prerogative, on the sovereignty of the states to regulate labor conditions, this law goes too far. If North Carolina wants to let their 18-year-olds or their 16-year-olds or their 14-year-olds work, North Carolina should be allowed to. When the feds come in and try to ban the shipment of labor made from those factories, it's intruding upon the individual liberty of the child and that of the state. Now this may be a jarring claim to say, wait a minute, how could it be? You know, does this 14-year-old really want to work in a factory? You're saying he has a liberty interest in working in a factory? That was the prevailing economic theory. The idea that you have the right to make a contract. And if you're a 14-year-old, 
your parent can make you engage in a contract. And the government can't get between you and the employer. Okay? The, dis the majority here, again, is working under the assumption that once you take down these limits between the state and the federal government, the states cease to exist. They say in the last paragraph, all freedom of commerce made an end, and the power of the states over local matters may be eliminated, and thus our system of government be practically destroyed. Here, we do not see much of the necessary proper clause. We barely see any of it, right? This is not consistent with McCullough in the least. This is consistent with E.C. Knight. It's consistent with DeWitt. It's consistent with Hepper and B. Griswold. I'll tell you folks, this is about the end of the road for this theory. Uh, uh, shortly after the New Deal, we come back to class on Thursday, the court deviates in the direction. And the dissent by Justice Holmes, Justice McKenna, Justice Brandeis, and Justice Clark takes a very different affair. They say this does not meddle with anything belonging to the states. States can regulate their own affairs. But when states uh, uh, seek to send products across their lines, they're no longer within their rights. Justice Holmes writes, this is the same as Champion the Ames. If we can regulate the shipment of lottery tickets because it's immoral, we can regulate the shipment of child labor produced goods, likewise, because it's immoral. Constitution of permits this, Justice Holmes. Okay. Questions on Hammer versus Dagenhart. Questions on Hammer versus Dagenhart. All right, let me summarize a bit for uh, this class. Um, one of the advantages of teaching these doctrines chronologically is you can see how they go all over the place, and they're not consistent. Last week, we started with McCullough, which Chief Justice Marshall gave a very broad reading to commerce and necessary and proper. We then deprived the Pennsylvania, where again the court gave a broad reading to necessary and proper with respect to the Future Slave Clause and the Future Slave Act. We moved on to a couple of opinions from Chief Justice Chase, who read federal power narrowly in DeWitt and Hepper. But then that was overturned shortly thereafter in Knox v. Lee. We get to the progressive era, and we have decisions in E.C. Knight and some years later in Hammer v. Dagenhart, which again read necessary and proper very narrowly, have a concern for the Tenth Amendment, and don't want to supplant the local police power. But the decision that will win the day is Champion v. Ames, that reads the Congress's power very broadly and allows Congress to prohibit shipment of lottery tickets across state lines in pursuit of a morality power, even though Congress has no police power under the Constitution. Any questions? I will see you on Thursday. Thank you very much.